I'm good till three. All right. Um, so I'm Sukant Tajra. I'm S. Hajra on Twitter. The company I work for is Cognitive Scale. Um, we do applied machine learning. Oh, we're in Austin, Texas. We do applied machine learning and NLP to kind of enterprise domains. And we have a commitment to type check functional programming. We do a good amount of work in Scala, and my team does some work in Haskell. So if that you know, rings your bell, you can uh, find me in the conference and give me a chat. We'll talk. So the title is called Less is More, and I think that kind of holds for a lot of abstractions, but we're gonna use Monad Reader as a case study. So let's see how that goes. Okay, so this is ostensibly a 10 minute talk, but it's been elongated because of uh, circumstances. So either way, there wouldn't be enough time to cover all these things. <clears throat> but you kind of normally have to cover some of these things, and it's nice to cover more of these things when you talk about Monad Transformer and Monad Transformers and how to use them. So I think, I think there are good resources on covering these things individually, but I think that when it comes to how these things integrate together and kind of compose into real applications, when I talk to different Haskellers or even different Scala developers, I get different kind of points on the design space. So to me, it kind of seems like we might have a little bit more socializing to do in, with respect to this. And so um, that's hopefully what I can help contribute towards. So this is the motivation. Oh, hold on, no, 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 we gotta have the whole thing. Yeah, that's very important to know, right. Okay, so Matt Parsons, who's here at the conference, and if you don't know him, you should, because he's pretty awesome to know, um, posted this on Twitter. And it's pretty funny, although you guys are not laughing. I think it's pretty funny. <laughs> All right, thanks, I like, I like, like sympathetic, I'll giggle for him. So at the end here, what we wanna do is we wanna represent something going from configuration to a program, okay? And somehow every programmer has the simplest idea, like what would be simpler to represent turning a configuration into a program than a type for configuration called config and a type for a program called IO. And then we, we're functional programmers, so what do we program with? Functions, right. So yeah, the, the bottom actually ends up being the first thing that any beginner programmer learns how to, I mean any beginner functional programmer learns how to do, which is config to IO. But there's a problem with that, which some of you may already know, but we'll go over that later. And then somehow we go into this cascade of abstractions. And this is Matt's joke, cascade of abstractions. I'm gonna, in my talk, maybe go through this something similar, but maybe slightly different. Because Matt's whole point is that by the third option, it's too much, something's wrong with it. Okay, now I know some people, this is actually kind of controversial. Some people might say, I don't see anything wrong with it at all. Which is cool, because I'm not really sure how controversial this talk is or is not. So I'm really interested in feedback afterwards. Especially after like the, neuroscience talk, uh, the keynote, and also talking to some APL people. I think that is kind of interesting because ultimately there's something about comprehension going on here. And so one of the things that I'd like to do is say, well, if we're gonna have some guiding principles moving us forward, what might be some guiding principles that help us understand why the fourth option is something that we favor and the third option is something that we don't. And I'm merely gonna argue it from a human comprehension perspective. Because if I can get all the value out of the third option, with something that's a little bit more convenient from a comprehension perspective, I'm gonna go for that option because I'm not losing anything. That's the goal. So what might I want from, from the perspective of human comprehension? So here's a thesis, and I'm not qualified to give it, but this is a 10 minute talk, and like, I'm not really worried. So if I'm talking about a high level idea, I would argue that something that impedes comprehension is the contrast from high level ideas to low level ideas, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It's just, it's, it's a lot of information, even if there are no such things as natural languages, which is ridiculous, right? English is not natural, Scala is not natural, Haskell is not natural, JavaScript is not natural. None of those things are natural, right? But we're still human beings, and we still have organs, these kind of, that perceive information, and then send that information into our brain, it rattles around, and then we have comprehension. I think that, I mean, I'm not gonna go like, I don't wanna be like overly like platonic about this thing, but I think there's something universal about that. So we wanna kind of think about the idea that maybe we have these high level ideas, and we'll, let's, let's use abstraction. Let's see if we can get the low level ideas that we don't really care about out of the picture. So we'll just have high level ideas, high level ideas, and then these small connectives that bridge these high level ideas to other high level ideas. I think that can aid comprehension. So the more we have of that, possibly the better. All right, so I would argue that config to IO kind of has that. What are the big ideas? Configuration, program, and the small connective is function arrow. And it kind of gets out of the way. It just fades into the background. All right, that's the controversial idea. I don't, <laughs> I don't know how controversial it is or is not, but talk to an APLer and it, it's kind of interesting. So um, here's an exercise, all right? Which one's better? Obviously B. 
Because spelling out bind, or if you're in Scala, spelling out flat map is just, it's not the point. The point of that is to be a small little thing that gets out of the way so you can see the program that you wanted to see. All right? So I'm not even arguing this from like a monad, you know, no, no, I'm not even talking about, I'm just talking about being a human being. So like reward, the API should reward you for being a human being and they should not penalize you for not being a machine. All right? That's kind of the, the running joke. I'll try to say it a few more times. Okay. So if you don't believe that, if you're Emily Dickinson, you probably wrote poem B because you wanted your poem to be read by humans and not poem A because you didn't want to punish people for not being machines. And why is A tough? It's tough because it is kind of this interplay between high level ideas and low level ideas, just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And it just makes for, it's not even about readability. Forget about reading, right? Because that's a very natural language kind of argument. It's just about speed of comprehension once you take familiarity out of the picture. All right, so that's the non-Cody part of this talk. We can talk a little bit about uh, config, all right? So what's wrong with config.io? It's really, it's really simple, so I'll just say, the OO people will say law of Demeter. That's like a really weird phrase, and it's hard to unpack, and I'm not sure it really means anything. But that is what they're talking about here. The problem is that, as the last presenter said, config is very often kind of a nested data structure. So make users making some presumption of what the nesting is, right? And um, it zooms in to that con to into that config in order to get what it needs. And get insights zooms in to get what it needs. It's possibly in a different place. That means that we have coupling now. That means if I refactor the, the structure of config, then I will have broken the implementation of make user and get insight. So that's bad because, you, because it's anti-modular. Because what's a good rubric of modularity? Like, well, or a way of uh, figuring out if you have it. So if you, if you change one thing, you shouldn't have to change other things that are not really related. You know, there should be separation of concerns. So that's bad, but we all know, I guess, because I, I don't know whether they thought about which talks to stage one before the other one, but it just turns out to be really good because the solution to this is this. Now, the previous talk didn't talk, I, I'm like hand waving because this is like, like intermediate. I'm, I'm just assuming you can follow. Um, so there are these, uh, the lens library provides these macros that will allow, they call them classy lenses. But don't even worry that they're lenses because honestly, that's a little bit adjacent to the point of this talk. There are these type classes that give you the ability, the capability to find what you need to now from this configuration object. And the configuration object is, is referred to parametrically. So we don't exactly know what that object is. We just know that we have these capabilities. Well, this solves our problem. This is actually pretty good. So if you said, you know what, this is it. I stop, I'm finished. I think this is pretty comprehensible because even though this database config, uh, this has data, maybe you could rename this, but you, know, you could make it about databases. And it's kind of exposing your dependencies. And that's kind of a high-level idea, the idea that you have functions and you want to know what their relationships is to the other functions and these kind of component-oriented things. The fact that they're components kind of makes them a little bit more kind of closer to your domain. So I'd argue this is a utility. You know, I mean, you could, I could argue that. And if you said, this is exactly what I want, I'm going to stick with this, a lot of people would say, okay, fine, you're good to go. And it even meets kind of my measure of, uh, the, the measure that I was saying about, you know, being relatively humanistic and convenient. So, but this IO is a little bit unfortunate. Some libraries don't like it when you use IO, so then they force you to use their monad. It happens, okay? Like Scotty or Scotty M or whatever, whatever monad you have. So now you have this monad IO. So now all of a sudden some things are beginning to creep into our constraint space. And then somebody notices here, wait a second, you have a whole bunch of C to Ms. What if we introduce monad reader? Oh, wow, this is awesome. What if we introduced monad reader? Well, <laughs> okay, fine. But function already had a monad instance, so I'm not really convinced this is like really helping me. Like now, now I've got all of these implementation details, like monad IO and monad reader, intermixed with the other things that I thought were okay. It, it's, I, it's, I'm, not, I'm not won over by this. And I think that we're actually walking down the path that makes Matt jo Matt's joke like uh, true, all right? And I think we can possibly do better. So if you had an API that you wanted in your mind, what better way to make it than to find, no, don't find another library, don't worry about it. You are a creative human being, write your own, all right? That's kind of like the power of this thing. And different people will do this different ways. So some people might like exposing uh, lenses on these, on these type classes, right? Some people might like exposing kind of uh, little utility kind of things that you can do. So here I just have the components listed out, a DB and metrics. 
And I, I just kept the name simple because that's how I thought about them in my domain, all right? And I've kind of done them in two styles, the monad IO and where monad IO is the super class of the, of, the, of the type class and one where it's just monad. You don't have to have anything there. This is not like set in stone. If you have monad IO, that's a little bit unfortunate because lifting arbitrary IO, uh, IO into, your, into your operations is kind of dangerous. Maybe that's not a good way to go. Um, but if you want to have your monad be monadic, I mean, it's nice to have the bind. I mean, this is kind of like DSLs for free. If, you're, if, you, if you want to use this thing monadically, then, you know, maybe just as a convenience, put the monad in there. So, and you can do that with applicative and any number of other things. So uh, if I had fireworks, I would fire them off now. But instead, all I have is code that seems to meet all my criteria. I think it's pretty good, actually. So... Um, I think that's relatively comprehensive, uh, comprehensible. It solves my design issues. If anybody wants to squabble about MTL or Monad Reader or Classy Optics or whatever, that whole, the, I've deferred all of the conversation until the instances. So I think it's kind of nice. I mean, it's a, it's a few more lines of code to write, but you're just saying what your contract is. So you can just start writing code. You can write clean code. So all of this stuff can just compose, 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 relatively clean, relatively like clear from the perspective of your domain. And you can use whatever advanced techniques you want to on the concrete instance that you run through this thing. So uh, here I've chosen to use, I mean, I wouldn't even call it a monad stack. I'm just, it's just a reader T. It's like barely a stack. So, but, and I've used generalized new type deriving in order to get enough power out of this app um, so that I can write, actually, I'll be honest with you, I didn't even type check that thing. I just kind of wrote it. So even if it didn't, even if it didn't type check, I, I, I'm pretty sure it can be done. Uh, but I'm, I think it's right. It doesn't matter. If it's wrong, somebody, if, it's, if it's wrong, that can be like the first thing somebody says. Um, okay, so I did not invent any of this stuff. It's existed for a long, long time. Um, I'm just trying to socialize this message. And honestly, I'm not even trying to tell you the solution is right. I'm just trying to get you to think about a few other things other than the million of like logistic things you're thinking about when you're trying to connect one library to another, not library to another. Just kind of like, well, what do you want? You just want to have a good API that's kind of, you know, nice on users. That's not a bad thing to shoot for, right? And even the last talk when it was talking about how lenses uh, compose I mean, a lot of work has been put into like the ergonomics of the lens library. It could have been a lot more inconvenient to use. So this thing is often called finally tagless off of like a, a couple of papers by Oleg Kiselyov and a few others. And uh, some people call it MTL style. And think about this. The MTL package is giving you these type classes, but you are in a position to make your own type classes. You don't have to use the type classes coming in from every library out there. You can, you know, make some. And uh, Chris Allen actually showed me this a little while ago. So I'll give him, I'll give him some credit for showing me this. Uh, the Katip library is a great example of, like, you don't, even if this thing didn't compile and it was frustrating that there were a bunch of ellipses in this code, there's a good example in this logging library in the Haskell ecosystem. That's a, a link to the file. So thanks. Remember, be nice to humans and try to not force them to be machines. And, uh, you know, just remember they've got information coming in through sensory organs that go through brains, yeah. All right, <laughs> that's my talk. This is my employer. I'm really grateful that they give me some time to come out here and do this, so that's it.